following program on Other Than Internet 24 is classified MA. It is intended for adults and may be unsuitable for children under 17. It may contain crude and decent language, explicit sexual activity, graphic violence, or political ideology. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. State of the Nation is an opinion-based program. The thoughts and opinions shared within this program are not intended to offend or disregard anyone's perspectives or beliefs. We aim to foster open dialogue, encourage critical thinking, and explore thought-provoking subjects. Recognizing the importance of diversity and inclusion, this program welcomes all viewpoints and cherishes the right to express them freely. The following program contains opinions of the participants and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Veterana Media Network. The network believes in a safe space for all ideas to be expressed and on its duty to create such a platform for free speech. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. The Tale of Debt and Recovery Sri Lanka aims to restructure its debt in a manner that would not impact the population adversely. We must admit that the proposals put forward by the government to restructure local debt are surprisingly positive towards the country. At least that's what the government is telling you and me. However, this is the first time such a debt restructuring effort has occurred in this country and its impact is yet to be determined. Tonight we dive deep into this and see whether we are safe or should we be concerned. For insights and analysis, tonight I will speak to economist and member of the Seattle City Council, Sharma Sawant, former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Nivad Kabra, former minister of mass media, Dr. Nalika Godeheva, economist from the University of Jaffna, Dr. Ahilan Kagragama, economist Brand Nicholas, and political economist, Dr. Devaka Gunavardhan. Good evening, I'm Mahesh Johnny, and this is the State of the Nation. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the State of the Nation, where we discuss various topics and share interesting viewpoints. Well, we're back after a couple of weeks, and before we dive into today's discussion, I'd like to take a moment to address an important aspect of our show. Opinions are integral to a healthy dialogue and can help foster meaningful conversations. However, it's vital to clarify a few key points to ensure transparency and maintain your trust as our valued viewers. Throughout the show, we strive to provide a platform for diverse opinions and beliefs which you may not find in the mainstream media. Our intention is not to go with the flow and pray kumbaya to everything that is being said by officials who are governing this country. On the contrary, we aim to challenge some of those narratives and provide you with a different perspective. It's important to understand that the opinions expressed by our guests, including myself, are our own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the entire team or the network. It's crucial to remember that opinions are subjective and can be influenced by personal experiences, education, and other factors. As our audience, we encourage you to engage with the content thoughtfully and respectfully and not to believe everything we say blindly, but do your own research. Through this show, we intend to provide a direct a direction of another opinion that would allow you to think a complete 360. So without further ado, let's get down to business. A couple of weeks back, the whole world was glued to news media to know what was going on with the Titan submersible that imploded in the North Atlantic Ocean. When the news broke on mainstream media on Sunday the 18th of June, we were told by that same mainstream media that officials had lost contact with the Titan submersible after one and a half hours into its dive, heading to the Titanic wreckage. Now, the officials, mainly the US Coast Guard, held media briefing after media briefing, telling the world what they were doing and what was happening. First, we were told that the submersible only had 96 hours of breathable oxygen, whereas all efforts are being made to launch a search and rescue operation to save the souls on board that vessel. We were told many ships and remote vehicles were called to the scene. 
we were hopeful that we could do something to save their lives as they were not dead fingers crossed they were just stranded at least that is what we were made to believe by those officials now two days into the whole drama the mainstream media told us uh, and later confirmed by these officials themselves that they were hearing a banging noise from the bottom of the ocean close to where the titanic wreckage was we were given hope that apparently the people inside the submersible were alive and that they were banging on the submersible to indicate their location the mainstream media made this a 24 hour drama where they got pundit after pundit to predict what was going on how they could survive and how all was tickety boo later on thursday 22nd of june the us coast guard the very same coast guard uh, who earlier said that they were looking for these people holds a media briefing and says the submersible imploded no one survived everything now at the bottom, bottom of the uh, atlantic ocean then we learn that apparently the us navy through its uh, high tech top uh, secret listening devices that are located in the ocean to detect possible missile launches by enemy submarines detected the implosion at the exact time the submersible lost contact on sunday now what does that mean the very officials who are supposed to tell the truth to its people lied or hid or were not honest from the get go they knew the submersible imploded precisely at the time it lost contact they knew that no rescue operation is required only a search for the remains they knew that all of the people on board the submersible were dead but never informed their loved ones and continued to give them false hope they knew when they were deploying million dollar crafts that they are not going to save anyone yet they chose to tell a lie to the world why well they will now cite many excuses but the truth is that they were dishonest from the get go now it makes you to wonder how much our so called officials be it here or abroad are lying to us daily while they know the truth the outcome and the end game while sending us on a wild goose chase the imf is the only solution comes to mind we'll be right back Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Tonight in our lead story is the domestic debt restructuring proposal that made its way to the parliament. I mean the proposal put forward by the central bank and its governor didn't spell out disaster the way we initially hoped. Well that's the truth. We were expecting that the central bank would propose a reduction of the principal loan amount and thank God they didn't. But now the central bank proposes to take a reduction from the interest rate by reducing the rate and extending the period of lending by the bank to the government. The impact of this is not as bad as initially thought. Here's the central bank governor Dr. Nandalal Veerasinghe explaining the whole proposal. Watch. Briefly what we are uh, what we have proposed uh, is to uh, there are three parts. Uh, the central bank holdings will be restructured. uh receipts bills will, will be exchanged uh for treasury bonds a longer term treasury bonds i think there is a grace period of 5 years and then maturity extension for treasury bills held by central bank second part so what we are cons- uh, suggesting is to uh offer a bo- tree bond exchange for treasury bonds held by superannuation funds including epf for which uh, uh what we what government uh, is offering uh, is uh, what we call step down coupon and the third option this is lkr option lankarup option which will uh, that under that option government will offer 10 year final maturity maturing in 2033 there no grace period well that was uh, the governor of the central bank dr nandalal virasinghe explaining exactly what they are hoping to do 
Uh, most of us don't understand economics. That's the truth, isn't it? And the people who we turn to explain the complex nuances do a terrible job at that because they talk to us in a language that you and I don't understand. They use a lot of jargon and make you and me feel like fools if we don't get it. But the truth is, most don't understand the economic processes. So let's try to understand what the governor is proposing here. Let's say you are a lender. In, in Sri Lankan terms, a poli mudalali. That gives money to anyone. You lend a friend 30,000 rupees at a rate of 30% interest to be paid back in five years, meaning if uh, we calculate the interest annually, it'll be around 6%. So in the end, you have to get back around 39,000 rupees with interest. For you, the poli mudalali, your income from lending money to a person is 39,000 rupees, basically an interest of 30%. You're not worried about lending money in rupees because your friend can pay back in rupees. It is guaranteed and hence considered risk-free. Remember that this is your business and you expect the income from lending to arrive on time so you can keep lending to others and profit from that same process. Now the situation gets a bit more complex. In addition to you, the, the local Puli Mudalali, there is a foreign lender too a foreign poli mudalali for that matter. He lends to the same friend that you lent, but in US dollars. Obviously, because the foreign lender only deals in dollars, the return is higher because the currency de devaluation does not affect him. He is up on the deal anyway. Initially, what we understand from the conversations our external debtors had with our government officials is that you have to reduce the principal amount you lent in rupees to your friend uh, if the foreign creditors has to reduce the principal amount lent in dollars. This is what they call comparable treatment. But is it comparable is the first question that we all need to ask. Also, if we look at the foreign creditors who have brought our ISBs, Entities like BlackRock and Vanguard, who are billion dollar companies, uh, taking a cut of 30% from the principal amount means nothing to their profits. But, but if our local banks do the same, it has a massive impact on the banks and in return our economy as well. We all know capitalism doesn't mean everyone is equal. So treating our foreign creditors and domestic creditors the same is a joke. For example, a $100 five-year international sovereign bond issued by the government of Sri Lanka in 2014 would have yielded an annual return of 6.4% in US dollar terms, while a five-year rupee denominated uh, treasury bond of an equivalent uh, US dollar value would have yielded minus 4.7% annually. US dollar terms uh, due to the currency fluctuations and, and the economic um, volatility. Now to argue that the restructuring of domestic debt should be on par with the restructuring of foreign currency debt is to argue that the risk of the two asset classes is the same. It is not. And that is one of the problem. Now moving on uh, to our previous example. Right now the central bank is proposing that you, the domestic lender, the Polimodalali, who lends in rupees, don't have to take a hit from your principal amount, meaning we are not touching that 30,000 rupees. Still, you've got to extend the repayment period, which invariably results in a lower income over time. Now, if we equate the Polimodalali uh, to the banks that lend to the government, they have a buffer kept for losses on their profits. It's not because uh, they anticipated a default or debt restructuring. That's how banks usually operate. They forecast and save a bit of money and keep it aside because in case uh, to weather a loss-making year. Now, a reduction in the interest rate would be manageable, though adverse, but not necessarily catastrophic. This is our way of muddling through this uh, and thus far without breaking the banking system. Let's get Dhani Dwitanavasam into uh, this uh, conversation uh, in order to understand this better. He's at the data board. Dhani, good to see you. Uh, what do you think? Uh, is this the best way forward in terms of the domestic debt restructuring process? What did you manage to learn? 
Right, Mai. So I'm going to tell you the three things that have been proposed by the central bank and really give an idea of what is going to happen or what has been proposed. The three basic things is, uh, before that, I want to give you an idea of what we are going to restructure here. So in total, it's six trillion rupees. That's what we are trying to restructure within this entire program. That's what the central bank has proposed. The first, the conversion of T-bills into T-bonds, which is basically an increase in maturity, to say, the, to say it in a very basic sense, will include about 2.6 trillion rupees. That 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 is that has been up for conversation but what the central bank has been saying is that the 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 conversion will be only with bonds held by the central bank or, or, or not not for not in general across all t bonds and all, all t uh, all treasury bills that have been held by private uh, holders Secondly, T bonds of funds. Now, uh, by funds is superannuation funds. Now, just to clear what superannuation is, a certain amount of money is given as uh, on, on, a, on a monthly basis, so that a pension is then received by an individual in a, in a later date. So, for super so talking about the EPF and the ETF. Exactly, exactly. The EPF and the EP, e, ETF. So those superannuation funds, there are T bonds that are held by uh, T bonds that are held by them. The, cent the amount that have been held by the central bank that will amount to 3.5 trillion rupees that will be resulted into two uh, in, in two very basic ways of uh, reducing interest rate. Now, firstly, till 2025, 12% 12 interest rate will be given, and from that point onwards, 9%. That was the key thing that's been discussed uh, across across social media platforms. And finally, the Sri Lanka developmental bonds and the FCBUs. Basically, FCBU stands for foreign currency banking units. Now, that will only have the rest, as in once you calculate 3.5 trillion and 2.6 trillion, the rest of it will be dealt here. Not a huge amount of money that will be restructured there but what we need to bear in mind is one of the uh, one of the points that have been mentioned there is that a 30% haircut will be given or will be requested from foreign uh, from from this foreign if if the SLDB holders want the option of going for U, uh, US dollar instruments now that they have mentioned within the central bank uh, governor's uh, presentation as well those are some of the key things we need to bear in mind Mahesh, when looking at this conversation on domestic debt restructuring over to you Mahesh. Indeed, uh, thank you very much, uh, Danidu. Uh, now, uh, you know, the, during the conversation with, uh, uh, not the conversation, the debate in Parliament, uh, even the opposition leader was saying uh, in his initial remarks that apparently um, the government was not forthcoming with all the details of the agreement with the IMF, uh, especially uh, during the, uh, the staff level agreement time, because they initially said, the government initially said that EPF funds and ETF funds would not be touched and there would not be any kind of uh, uh, issue for that. But now uh, with this debt restructuring process, domestic debt restructuring process, they're coming back and uh, talking about, like you just mentioned uh, about uh, EPF and ETF, those funds also will be impacted. Is that the case? Yeah, that is that that actually that conversation is actually ongoing right now, Mahesh, because people are trying to calculate the exact amounts that are going to be affected because that's not clear. Because we are talking, we are looking at volatile subjects such as the dollar rate. Indeed. Uh, well, Dani Dutanwasam, as always, thank you. Now let's get more perspective on this. Joining me now via Zoom from Jaffna is economist from the University of Jaffna, Dr. Ahilan Kandragamara. Thank you very much, Doctor, for your time. Now that we know what the central bank and the government uh, hopes to do with the local debt, is this the best way forward? Now, Mahesh, um, we have been uh, waiting for some time to see how the government would move forward. Um, their approach towards domestic debt restructuring and in particular uh, targeting the, the retirement funds is completely unacceptable because uh, they have let uh, private domestic bondholders scot free they have let the finance companies scot free and they are going after hard-earned people's retirement funds which is their future now the government says that there is no haircut but in reality over the next 15 years when the government drastically reduces the interest earned by the treasury bonds for these retirement funds, the opportunity cost lost is huge. For many people, their retirement funds could even decline by a third compared to where it would be if this domestic debt restructuring did not happen. So this is uh, completely uh, unacceptable. I think uh, all people who have retirement funds should definitely oppose this kind of move. Indeed. Uh, doctor, if it's not this way, then what do you propose? Mahesh, we did not have to go into domestic debt restructuring because the main problem that Sri Lanka 
is facing now is the future of our external debt. Now, now when it comes to external debt, we can't create US dollars. We need hard currency and we don't have it. So therefore we need a large haircut to be able to repay uh, those loans. The kind of haircut that the government is asking for, which is a mere 30 percent is not enough at all. The bondholders, they made a killing in Sri Lanka over the last decade and a half. And we should even ask for debt cancellation if that's the way in which we can have a sustainable economy going forward. When it comes to domestic debt, we can lengthen it out. We can take other loans domestically. And when times are much better, uh, we can address it. So there's no need to go into domestic debt restructuring. The only reason why the government is doing that is because they want to stick to the IMF program and they're willing to do whatever is necessary that the IMF is asking them to do. But this is not going to uh, help us in terms of rebuilding our economy. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's leave it at that. This subject really needs a lot of time to discuss and we definitely will do that in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, economist Dr. Ahilan Kadir Kamar from the University of Jaffna. Let's get another perspective. Joining me now via Zoom from Sacramento, California is political economist Dr. Devaka Gunavardhana. Thank you very much, Doctor, for being here. Now, Doctor, despite many examples of domestic debt restructuring, it has proven to be damaging for the domestic structure in the long term. In this instance of uh, domestic debt restructuring, uh, in this proposed uh, manner, what are the long-term repercussions of that? So Mahesh, uh, this is actually, it's a relatively new phenomenon, this domestic debt restructuring that the IMF is now pushing as uh, part of its agreements. For example, recently Ghana also uh, obtained an IMF agreement in which they have also included this measure of domestic debt restructuring. But what this ends up doing is it's another kind of conditionality that the IMF is um, imposing through its agreements. Uh, for example, we know that from last year onwards, they uh, were requesting that the government um, achieve a, a fiscal consolidation, right? Which means balancing the budget with the revenues that the government receives through, for example, taxes. And so this encouraged the government uh, to raise um, various taxes, direct and indirect. But in the case of now this new condition of domestic debt restructuring, really what the issue is, is that it is conflating two types of debt, the external debt and the domestic debt. And, you know, again, in each of these cases, you have very different creditors that are involved. So, for example, they'll say about 60 percent of Sri Lanka's GDP is external debt and domestic debt is about, uh, again, also 60% of GDP. So when you add those two numbers together, you get over 120% uh, debt to GDP ratio for 2022, for example. Um, but again, this the real issue here is that Sri Lanka experienced a sovereign bond crisis, meaning the dollar denominated bonds that Sri Lanka issued um, they could no longer roll those over, and so it experienced a crunch of its foreign exchange. But with this domestic debt, what we're talking about really are, you know, bonds that are issued by the government. And again, every government issues bonds as part of its, you know, standard procedures. And so if you talk about reducing those through haircuts or other forms of restructuring, it could affect different creditors such as the Employees Provident Fund that holds uh, some of these government bonds. So again, these are two very different things. Doctor, uh, let's talk about uh, the other side of this uh, as well. If external creditors are saying that despite the problem lies with them, they say to level the playing field, you should restructure both domestic and foreign debt. What should our approach be then? So I think, Mahesh, that the issue is right now, Sri Lanka is experiencing an economic depression. So what you want actually is to increase 
government spending in this depression. Uh, but of course, because of the IMF agreement, there are very stringent targets. And so by going after domestic debt, what that's doing is it's restricting these state-backed liabilities that are actually necessary for, for, for borrowing and spending even during a depression. For example, you know, with the interest rates increasing, it's already become very difficult for small and medium enterprises. And so if you further restrict capital because banks are forced to recapitalize because of this restructuring, then again, those loans will be much harder. Domestic loans will be much harder for ordinary people to obtain. So I think when we're talking about this debt restructuring, we have to be very clear that the, the, the creditors that need to accept a haircut are the external creditors, meaning the external bondholders, the ones who hold the sovereign bonds. But that's not what this government is talking about right now. They're talking about, again, this new IMF conditionality. And again, it's a form of austerity where you are rationing or restricting credit because of um, the, cre the availability of credit because of this um, sort of haircut that they also want to impose on um, the domestic bonds. But again, the real issue is that the external creditors are not yet willing to accept a bigger haircut. Absolutely. It makes a lot, a lot of sense. Uh, thank you very much. We have to leave it at that. That was Political Economy's Dr. David Kudu all the way from uh, Sacramento, California. Let's take a short commercial break. Most state of the nation right after this. Back here. for having pulled this off. Uh, it's uh, definitely a big relief. Like As you came in, uh, sir, you saw the smile on everyone's face. Um, and I think uh, the question we have to ask you is uh, how, how can we do, uh, how, what help does the government need from us? What are the things that we should do and not do that you would like us to take back from this meeting? From the private sector, from Ceylon Chamber's point of view, I think uh, this is probably the best thing that could have happened, uh, especially uh, protecting the banking system, uh, because otherwise already struggling economy, uh, we would have struggled with the banks uh, having to have other issues. But having said that, uh, hopefully uh, the banks will now start making cheaper funds available to the private sector. I think that has been uh, not coming forth. Uh, so we really look forward to that happening. This way investments can continue. I think everything has come to a standstill in the last 18 to 24 months. Uh, so the economy to move forward, we need cheaper funds to coming into the private sector. Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Uh, those were views from leading businessmen in the country with regard to the domestic de debt restructuring uh, effort uh, by the government. There was a, a question that was raised during that meeting saying that apparently what we should do and we should not do. Well, there is also that conversation saying that around $53 billion is being parked. Uh, Sri Lanka's money being parked outside, so maybe find a mechanism to bring them back. Now, with the domestic uh, debt restructuring in full swing, there is a consensus that the proposal put forward by the central bank and the government is the best way forward, as you just saw uh, by uh, the comments made by various individuals in the financial sector. However, the opposing view is that this domestic debt restructuring was not required. And mind you, Sri Lanka has yet to undertake such a task. And so we really don't know how this will turn out. Perhaps, touch wood, it will fix our economy or it will showcase more vulnerabilities which we did not foresee prior. Now, one thing you need to keep in mind is that all these tasks undertaken right now should be on the basis that the country's economy is going to flourish in the future and that all Sri Lankans will benefit. 
If not, there is no justification for the pain that we all are going through right now. Now, there was an individual who was completely shunned by the Colombo liberal uh, idiot class who predicted what would happen when we go to the IMF. He's none other than uh, the former governor of the Central Bank, Ajit Mahat Cabral, who joins me now. Thank you very much, former governor, for your time. Um, as these domestic debt restructuring efforts are underway, what do you think we must do as a nation? Because debt restructuring, in a way, is good uh, um, in order to make our economy healthy. Uh, good evening, Mahesh. Uh, good to be talking to you. I don't know who said that de debt restructuring is a good thing. I personally don't think debt restructuring is a good thing. If it was a good thing, you could, you'll find that all the entrepreneurs going and defaulting and saying, we don't want to get our debt restructured. So it's not a good thing. But in this instance, we have done it. Whether it is right or wrong, it has been done. And I personally don't think that by debt restructuring, we can ever come out of a problem. Why does a person need de debt restructuring? It is because they are unable to pay their debts. Now, if you are unable to pay your debts, the first thing that you don't do is to, the first thing that you do is not to go and ask your debt for, to be forgiven. You have to see whether you can increase your income. Now, if a person says, I'm not able to pay my debts, if he goes to the bank, the bank will say, hey, I'm not going to cut your debt, but you try and increase your income. That's the first thing. Now, we have to make sure that we increase our incomes and that we reduce our expenditure in whatever way we can and then become a viable nation. That is what is needed to be done. Instead of that, if we go and say we are not going to pay our debt and therefore we are going to default, we will have that stigma and I can tell you that is not going to be helpful at all in the future workings of our country. And at the same time, no economy has ever become prosperous by defaulting on its creditors. When you default on your creditors, people think that you are a bankrupt, that you will not honor your word and that is the worst thing that can happen to a nation or to an entrepreneur in that, in that sense. So I think we need to get this feeling out of our minds that by doing debt restructuring, we are going to have everything to be uh, rosy and that we can deprive creditors who have given us money of their dues and then we can prosper with that. So we need to if you want to become a healthy nation and a healthy economy, we need to pay our debts and at the same time we need to grow our economy, we need to grow our incomes to be able to sustain our economy in a sustainable manner. And if we do not do that, I think we are going to be in serious trouble. Absolutely. Governor, uh, you accurately predicted the cascading events following our deal with the IMF. Your predictions on increasing interest rates, floating the rupee, uh, rationalizing expenditure, cutting state sector jobs, selling state assets, cutting subsidies and uh, the subsequent r r rise of inflation were on point. Now, I would say you got it right, not because you know, you're a magician, but because you have past experiences uh, with dealing with the IMF. So now tell me, former governor, what is your take on this current domestic debt restructuring plan which has been put forward by the government? Many believe it is done correctly. Your reaction? You see, when you go on that path, you are traversing an unknown. You will find that in your debt restructuring, you are going to be encountering hostile stakeholders. Do you think that if you go to the bank and tell the bank, hey, I'm not going to pay half your loan, that you will have a sustainable and a good relationship with that bank ever again or with that uh, of a creditor ever again? So I think that's an important starting point in this exercise. You said that I was spot on in my predictions as far as what would happen when you go to the IMF. This is another prediction that I'm going to make. If you go along this debt restructuring path and you deprive creditors who have given you money of their dues, you will find that it's always going to be a hostile reaction that you would receive from them. So we need to repair that. So I believe if we are to really get going, we have to increase our incomes, as I said earlier. Increasing our incomes means we have to find ways and means of doing that. Now, this plan that has been submitted by the bank has absolutely no mention of anything like that. 
There is no mention of increase of incomes. There is no mention as to how we are going to grow our GDP. And what they are talking about the debt to GDP. And debt to GDP has two components. One is the debt and the other is the GDP. So, if you do not grow your GDP and you are thinking of only decreasing your debt by depriving creditors of their dues, I think we are going on the wrong path. The path that we should strive to move is to see that we increase our GDP. Then we will be able to have investment coming in, we will be able to have stakeholders who have faith in our country, who trust us and if we do that, then we will be on the right track. Instead of that, if we are hell bent on finding ways and means of crushing our creditors and crunching our economy to be becoming lower and lower in its space, then you would find that we are not going to get anywhere. Mind you, we have now reduced our GDP quite substantially. For the last four quarters, we have had negative growths of over 8, 9, 10 percent sometimes. Now, when you have situations of that nature, where are you going to have the space to increase your taxes? Can people who are in, having lesser incomes pay additional taxes? We can't. The other one more point that I want to mention about the uh, restructuring is that we are, I think, going uh, the way of touching the superannuation funds, especially the EPF. And that is not going to be something that will be taken kindly by people. And the political turmoil that we would see as a result of that and the fallout from that can be very damaging. And just the same way that the central bank and the government is thinking about financial system stability, you also got to think of political and social stability. If the political and social stability is not established and that is being, uh, that is being damaged by certain policies that we are implementing, we will find it is very, very difficult to have financial stability as well. So, I think we got to work on those areas and if we are going to have overall acceptance by all the creditors, we will need to definitely change this proposal that we have got on the ground and unless we do that, we are not going to get very far. Indeed, uh, former governor, unfortunately, we are running out of time. We really need to discuss more on this uh, and I hope to get you on board soon and to give a different perspective to our viewers on this matter. Former governor of uh, the Central Bank, Ajit Nivad Cabral, thank you. Now, as our nation's parliament debated this matter yesterday, what is your view? What is the view of the opposition? all those were reactions uh, from several members of the opposition with regard to the domestic debt restructuring proposal put forward by the government. Now, also joining me now is the, uh, in order to give the opposition's point of view, uh, is the former Minister of Mass Media, Dr. Nalika Gudeheba. Thank you very much uh, for your time, sir. Doctor, I hope you had uh, the time to review the government's proposals for the domestic, domestic debt restructuring effort, uh, which you all debated yesterday as well. What are your thoughts and more importantly, will you support it? Mahesh, now uh, one thing we have to make very clear is that we never objected to government going to IMF. In fact, when uh, it took place, we were some people who uh, agreed to that, applauded it at that time. But we have criticism about the way the government is handling the whole government negotiation and the implementation. Now, for example, uh, when it comes to debt restructuring, uh, we agree the government has to do some kind of debt restructuring. Uh, there, the foreign debt restructuring is something that perhaps you have to do. But domestic debt restructuring is something that nobody asked for. When I say nobody, IMF never asked for domestic uh, debt restructuring specifically. They asked the government to bring, that, bring down the debt to GDP ratio. Uh, and how we are going to do that is up to the government. That is what they said. It is a government which jumped the gun 
and made a commitment that they would do a domestic debt restructuring also. It, it started with the president writing to all the creditors and say every creditor will be treated equally. So nobody asked for it. Government went and made a commitment. Now, when we look at the domestic debt restructuring, uh, some people argue and say it is not as bad as people thought. But we would say it was totally unnecessary. Now, look at the things the government has done. The government basically argues and says you want to uh, bring down the, uh, do, the gross finance needs uh, as a percentage of GDP. Car uh, currently, it's at about 34%. Uh, let's say IMF has specified that it has to be brought down to about, uh, let's say, 14%, 13% by about uh, 2032. So, in order to bring down the uh, gross uh, finance needs, they say you have to restructure all kinds of debts, foreign as well as domestic. However, I would argue otherwise. Why do you have to bring down the uh, gross, domestic, gross financing needs? Why can't you increase the GDP? If you increase the GDP through proper focus on the economic development, end result is the same. This is what the government keeps missing. They keep talking about debt. They keep talking about financial need from somebody else. But they don't talk about how you are going to have a proper plan to develop the economy. So if you increase the GDP through proper economic development, there's no need for domestic restructuring. And the other most important thing is, the, the government tried to touch the EPF. As a result of this DDR, there's going to be an impact on the EPF where the EPF holders have absolutely no control over. This is something that we are against. We are totally against that. So that is why we are objecting to that. Uh, indeed. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Uh, that was uh, the former Minister of Mass Media, Dr. Nalaka Gudeheva. Well, there is another school of thought. Some believe that since we have already defaulted, doing a domestic debt restructuring would further put the credibility of the government at risk because T-bills and T-bonds were considered to be risk-free investments. Earlier, I spoke to economist Bram Nicholas about this. Watch his response. They've actually come with another reason for doing the domestic debt restructuring. And that is, the argument is, it's supposed to promote debt sustainability. Now, the problem there I have is that two very important things are not being considered. And that is that once the government defaults on domestic debt, it sets a precedent. And that means that from now on, an asset that was supposed to be risk-free is suddenly risky. And that changes everything. And you know, this is something that I'm not seeing in the news anywhere, and I don't think is carefully considered by the policymakers, is that changing government debt into something risky changes everything. And I'll give you the two most important consequences. The first is that you're going to now lose uh, government bond interest rates as a benchmark interest rate. Because commercial banks, they use, uh, let's say, the treasury bill rate or the treasury bond rate as a benchmark rate for setting their loans and deposit rates. And that is now no longer possible because the government debt has become, has lost its risk-free nature. So the benchmark will be have to replace with something else. The other far bigger problem is that actually now, because of the possibility of default, there's going to be a risk premium on the interest rates on government debt. And that will actually increase the cost of financing debt going forward, rather than improve the sustainability, which is the whole thing they're hoping to achieve. Sure, that might be the case in the short run, but in the long run, you'll actually have higher interest rates and higher costs of financing the debt for the government. Well, that was the economist Bram Nicholas speaking to me earlier. Let's take a short break. This is a State of the Nation back in a minute.
Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now, it is safe to say that the International Monetary Fund solely governs Sri Lanka's economy. They're basically the masters of our economic destiny. Even though our government is trying to showcase that everything is huggy-dory, history dictates that these policies uh, proposed by the IMF will not make us economically independent, but more of a subservient state to big economies. If you still think that we will be like Singapore, well, you can forget about it. Because to even get closer to being an economy like Singapore, this methodology of letting organizations like the IMF, whose allegiance is basically to the United States, dictate our destination is something that we need to do away with. When a country seeks financial aid from the IMF, they are typically required to implement certain measures known as conditionalities, which is exactly what we are currently experiencing. These conditions aim to stabilize the country's economy, but can often have detrimental effects on its citizens. These condition conditionalities have often resulted in austerity measures, reducing uh, social spending, job losses, and increased poverty. Sounds familiar, isn't it? This can undermine the very foundation of a developing nation like ours, progress, making it hard for us to achieve long-term sustainable growth. While the IMF uh, provides short-term assistance to countries in need, the conditions attached to their loans prioritize repayment over the well-being of citizens. This approach can perpetuate an endless cycle of debt for those countries, hindering their ability to invest in healthcare, education and infrastructure. However, for our Colombo liberal idiot class, IMF is the savior. If the IMF is such a pro in fixing economies, my question is, why are they then proposing very harmful solutions to nations like ours? And joining me now via Zoom all the way from Seattle is a member of the Seattle City Council economic uh, economist, uh, Sharma Savant. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, now, madam, the IMF program is in full effect in Sri Lanka and we have seen a bit of calm in the economic crisis. According to a liberal economist, it indicates that these policies are working. In your opinion, is that the case? Mahesh, it's so important that you ask this question because uh, whatever so-called calm that might exist for a moment is completely superficial and uh, we should not allow it to mask the intense economic crisis that the masses in Sri Lanka continue to face and we know from the history of the IMF that country after country after country in the neocolonial world, nation after nation, has been further decimated through the policies of the IMF. And in fact, if you look at what happened last year with the um, just really inspiring and courageous revolutionary movement, including the general strikes that happened in Sri Lanka, we had millions of people marching in, on the streets, hundreds of thousands of plantation workers, tens of, tens of thousands of workers from the free trade zone factories, public transportation workers, teachers, health workers, bank employees, workers at the ports, fishermen. I mean, you name it, and that occupation was represented in this revolt against the long-standing crisis and then the major economic collapse that has happened in the nation because of the cost of living crisis. Uh, but Sri Lanka is hardly alone in this situation. We, in fact, even in the just the same region, we are seeing Pakistan in complete crisis and chaos. We're seeing crises in countries like Bangladesh and Nepal. And, you know, uh, uh, my home country, India, we, are, we have seen general strike after general strike against many of the policies of the Modi regime, including the exacerbating uh, economic collapse due to the cost of living crisis. And so while the IMF says that they're doing de debt restructuring and they say this is a lifeline, in reality, it is going to send the nation into a further debt spiral. You know, right now you have half of Sri Lankan families buying food on credit. And now through the IMF policies, the government has announced reducing salaries in public service agencies, eliminating subsidies for food and fuel. None of this is going to solve the problem. Understood. Now, Madam, now, organizations like the IMF and the World Bank were created purely for American dominance back in, uh, you know, in the 50s or the 40s, I believe. But that America no longer exists. There is an entirely different uh, America right now. 
So why are these harmful policies being pushed when there is a better way to have trade dealings uh, that will allow America to thrive with many nations and its people? As you correctly indicated, Mahesh, this is a new world era that we are in and the superpower of American capitalism that existed a while ago does not exist in the same way as it did before. It is a weakened power, same with China. China is a weakened power. But at the same time, the reason we see these uh, these very exploitative policies from organizations like the IMF and the World Bank continue to be thrust upon poor nations is because we still have the dominant system. I mean, glo capitalism is, is what runs global society. And as long as we have the global capitalism in place, we are going to see Western and powerful financial powers and, and I don't mean ordinary people in America. I'm talking about the billionaire class in America, the billionaire class in Europe. They are going to continue to exploit. And they do, they carry out a two-fold exploitation, you know. There, there's exploitation and economic suffering of the mass of American population. You know, mass of American workers don't benefit from these policies. The masses of European working class don't benefit from the policies of the IMF. But who does benefit? It's the wealthiest people in the world. And we should not forget that even a country like India has its own homegrown capitalist class. And it's in its own right, it's an imperialist power and it's an imperialist power regionally. And in fact, in the new world order that is emerging, India is being groomed as an ally of the US side as a bulwark against China. So we're going to see further imperialist policies being driven, of course, not, not to mention the war in Ukraine. And so in the, in this context of capitalism and imperialist war, we're not going to see any different than the past in terms of the exploitation of the people in neocolonial nations. So that's why we need uh, really fundamental alternatives to capitalism. Indeed. Uh, well, we have to leave it at that. Uh, thank you. That was the member of the Seattle City Council economist, Sharma Samat. A short break now. Be back in a moment. At this uh, critical juncture in our country's history, we need to realize that our finances are at the mercy of foreign entities. We haven't led the fox into the hen house. The least we can do is be cognizant of that fact. But is that enough? As a society that is trying to be better, is that enough? Knowing that, we are in a pile of dung. It's frustrating, but we can't give up on making the right cause. At least now, we need to be able to negotiate being pro-Sri Lankan and not pro some random economic textbook. On a programming note, make sure you check our State of the Nation podcast out every week. The State of the Nation podcast is available on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Also, do get in touch with us uh, as we would like to hear your views, feedback and suggestions. You can write to us about anything you saw on the program. You agree, disagree, please send us your comments to stateofthenation at derana.lk. I'm Mahish Johnny. From all of us at Aviv 24, have a good night and a productive week. I'll see you on Tuesday on Get Real.